Hi everyone. Just before we started this show, we wanted to remind you of something that you should already be well aware of, which is that our esteemed colleagues and co-podcasters, Dan Schreiber and Andrew Hunter-Murray, have both written books, and they are truly fantastic books. So, if you have anyone in your life who is a Fish fan, who, God forbid, thinks that Dan and Andy are the superior half of Fish, perhaps that person is you, then why not get them for Christmas? A book by Dan and a book by Andy. Dan has written The Theory of Everything Else. And honestly, when I read it, on every page, I thought, how have you been hogging these facts for this book rather than sharing them on the podcast? It is so selfish. But it's made for a brilliant book, stunning revelations on every page. Andy has written The Last Day and The Sanctuary. They're both thrillers. They're real page turners. There are fantastic twists and turns. And of course, they're making some very intelligent points about society today. So get both of those for anyone you know who's a big fan of Dan and Andy. But Anna, what if the people listening to this prefer this half of the podcast, the James and Anna half of the podcast? What are those people going to do? Oh, you mean the 95 other percent of our listeners? <laughs> oh, I, um, I don't know, James. Have we done anything interesting lately? We have indeed. I don't know if you recall, because it was before you went on maternity leave, but we (laughs) wrote a book called Everything to Play for, the QI book of sports. And it is another book that is jammed full of facts. Do you know why ancient Egyptian athletes removed their spleens? Why pool balls no longer explode on impact? How bum slapping improves team performance? All that and more you can learn in our book, which is called Everything to Play For, the QI book of sport. But the truth is, if you or anyone you know is a big fish fan, these are the perfect things to get them for Christmas. Who doesn't love opening a present at Christmas and getting a good old book that they can... Read. (laughs) Read. (laughs) If you too like to do this strange reading thing that Anna does, then go to nosuchthingsafish.com forward slash books and you'll be able to find all the details of those three books, but they're available wherever you buy your books. Get them all. Get them for everyone you know for Christmas. Get them now. On with the show. On with the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hobart. My name is Dad Schreiber, I am sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray and Anna Tashinsky and once again we have gathered round the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go! Starting with fact number one, that is Anna. My fact this week is that your brain contains a tender mother a tough mother and a spider mother. Ooh, is that just Dan we're talking about here? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and it explains everything. It does. Are these like multiple personality traits of like, I have a oh. tough mother that comes, is that the idea of it? Oh, I oh, love that I idea. What would the spider mother be? Well, I assume there's something that they do in the wild where they make webs. <laughs> I think they like them. eat their children. Yeah, yeah they eat yeah. each other. The spider mother actually eats the tough mother and the tender mother. It's actually neither of these things. Um, they're just fun names for things in the brain. So these are meninges. They're in your brain and spinal cord. And they're basically a three layered envelope that protects your brain and spinal cord. And there's a delicate inner layer, which is called the pia mater, which means sort of tender mother or soft mother or pious mother and so that wraps around the brain and spinal cord a bit like cling film and then Mm. there's a really tough outer layer which is just under the bone of your skull and that's the dura mater the hard mother tough mother and then there's a middle layer the arachnoid mater and that's like a network of tissues Mm. and uh, um the tissue sort of spread out like a spider's web so really it should be called a spider web mother but it's not Mm. the um meninges is you know a baby at the top of their head they have like a gap where the skull hasn't covered them up oh yeah Mm. the meninges is the kind of tough stuff that covers their brain which means that at least the brain isn't sticking out of the head that's interesting i didn't know that and also that little hole there that is what the company baby gap is named after (laughs) i was just looking at sort of things that happen in the brain unusual processes and things like that yeah i really like this your brain is so fast that you can judge whether someone is trustworthy or not even if you haven't seen them consciously. Okay. So they tried this thing where they showed people images for like a fraction of it, like a millisecond, a couple of milliseconds, right? Too fast 
for people to consciously register they had seen a face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were either faces that were, you know, untrustworthy looking or trustworthy looking or whatever. I don't know what the criteria yeah, exactly. were. What is that? Is it like <laughs> one person they've got, you know, a, a fag out the corner of their mouth <laughs> not, and a I'm, big overcoat on? <laughs> and a bag tank swag. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, don't, I have no idea. Maybe they had to assess from people what they found trustworthy yeah, or untrustworthy yeah. first. Yeah. Some people might only trust people who look like sort of comedy burglars from the 1980s. <laughs> yeah. But when they showed them those images, even for a fraction of a second, they didn't consciously see them, but the bit of their brain, the amygdala, uh -huh. which processes strong emotions, particularly in relation to whether you trust mm -hmm. someone or not, fired up. Wow. Uh, okay. Isn't that weird? Wow. That is weird, yeah. Do you know what the amygdala means? Almond. Yeah. Wow. The brain is just full of weirdly named stuff because mm. it's like a structure and people were, could look at it hundreds of years ago if they took out someone's brain after they died and like name the bits of the structure. It's just got all really old fashioned odd names mm. like almond. Seahorse. Indeed. Famous one. Oh yeah, the seahorse. Sea yeah. It's because like if you, if you are looking at someone's brain and you're like, which bit do I need to take out? And mm -hmm. they say, well, it's the blah, blah, Fontanelle or whatever. You wouldn't yeah. know what it was. But if you say the seahorse, you can look at it and go, oh, that looks a bit like a seahorse. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, take yeah. that bit and out. Take that bit out, yeah. That makes sense. The Marta, the Pia Marta and mm -hmm. the other Martas, um, they're named after the fact that they kind of cover things like a mother might hold her baby. Oh. Uh, they come from the Arabic. Wow. I wonder with the speed that you were talking about a second ago, Andy, the... Like, I was just thinking, a quiz show, right? How quickly yeah. does the answer come to you <laughs> prior to your finger, the information getting to your finger and you pressing a buzzer, right? Yeah. If you were able to hook up your brain to the bit that lights up that says you know the answer, how quick could it be? Are you pitching a quiz where no one actually asks the questions and people just buzz in and say, <laughs> no, no, you, need, no you need the question. <laughs> Are you thinking that, like, you'll go on University Challenge yeah. and everyone else is using their fingers like absolute noobs yeah. and you've got something attached to your actual Competitive brain? Competitive advantage. Got, you've got your head on the button. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. I, I, I look like I'm keeled over, but no. Yeah. Driver um, Australia. <laughs> the only flaw in your plan, Dan, yeah. is that you actually wouldn't know any of the answers anyway, so it really doesn't matter how you're pressing the button. That's true. I've but genuinely they... never got an answer right on a university challenge. No, I think that's good. If they show you the question for yeah. a millisecond and the part of your brain associated with Turkmenistan fires, then it's actually a team of neuroscientists who answer the question for you. Uh, but like oh, yeah. several days later after doing the analysis. <laughs> but it is the kind of thing your brain does and mostly I associate this sort of thing with... Um, that, you know, there's that split brain operation that yeah. used to be done on epileptic people. Yes. It was like a, it was a revolutionary operation, and you basically cut the brain in half down the corpus callosum, which is the bit that splits the left side from the right side of the brain. And it was amazing because it stopped people having epileptic fits when nothing else would work. They did loads of experiments on these people whose two brains were working fine, but they couldn't communicate with each other. Mm. And so the reason I thought, for instance, of that university challenge thing was that someone who'd had that operation, they would be shown a picture of a face to their right eye, which goes into the left hemisphere, and they're asked what they've seen, and they can say face. But if it goes into the other eye and into the opposite hemisphere, because it's going to the wrong hemisphere that doesn't process language, once they're asked what they've seen, they can't say face, but they can draw a face. Oh, I mean, their language wow. is still completely yeah, fine, yeah. They, but they'll just say, How I've got no idea what I've seen, mm. yeah. but their hand will draw a face. Here's my pitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a cop drama, right? And as a witness to a crime, but yeah. he only saw it with one eye, the eye which doesn't know what, but he, yeah. can, he can draw it. And you've it. got a cup, but he's <laughs> only got the other eye. Yes! <laughs> yes! Right. And it's basically Pictionary. Pictionary <laughs> Cop. That's actually really good. <laughs> and that could be a sequel to um, Dictionary Cop, which oh, is... Oh, right. I um... thought you were going to be like Buckaroo Cop. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mousetrap Cop. Jenga Cop. Yeah. Oh, he's got two hours to stop this uh, building falling over. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not got any mortar. It's just bricks. I but, guess, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. fine. It's a dry stone building. <laughs> and one of the bricks has got a bomb in it. But he doesn't know which one. And so he has to keep removing the bricks to That's find great. the bomb yeah. uh, without the building falling down. But it's in a very congested area, so he can only put the bricks on top of the building at the top. <laughs> <laughs> <They need to move. laughs> this is quite good. Dry stone wall is probably set in the Cotswolds, so you've yeah. had some lovely location filming before the... Yeah, yeah. Mm. This mm. is bloody good. Jamie yeah. Cop. 
There is just sorry one one other a possible spy film follow up, oh, yeah. <laughs> where you can basically get people to say things that they don't know they've said. I guess because there was another guy who'd had his brain cut in half, um, and they asked him the question to one yeah. side of his brain. They flashed the question, "Who's your favorite girlfriend?" He was a, little, a boy. Oh a right, boy. Yeah, yeah. Who's your favorite girlfriend? And then he was asked, "Do you know what question we've asked you?" And he was shrugged and was like, "No, I haven't seen anything. I didn't see anything." Yeah. But then he spelled out. He giggled. Said no, and then spelled out Liz in Scrabble tiles right. with his other hand. How S awful is that? You're just wow. giving Scrabble stuff away. Tiles, ten points as well for the Z. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you put on a triple word score as well. <laughs> well, and that's your follow up to the uh, <laughs> Scrabble cup. <laughs> Scrabble cup. That's good. <laughs> Have you guys heard of hemi neglect, which is kind of in the same? sphere here. Hemi neglect. Hemi neglect right. is when, this is people who have had a stroke, there's a bit of brain damage that goes on whereby they only experience basically one side of their visual field. Mm -hmm. So if they've gone to shave, they'll shave off half their face, <laughs> but leave the other side because it's just not part of their field anymore, right? If they're eating yeah. on a plate, they'll eat the right side or left side yeah. of the plate. They'll eat just one side yeah, of the yeah. plate. So it's not just that you can't see, presumably, it's that your brain refuses to acknowledge your, that the your other Your brain is there. refusing to acknowledge that yeah. it's there, yeah. But this is what's amazing. They started looking into hemi-neglect within memory as well. So they managed to find a group of people where all of them had been to Milan. So they asked them the exact same thing. You're standing in the major plaza in Milan. Recall as many stores and streets around you as possible in the square. And they could only remember the stores and the streets that were on the right side what? and not the left. Incredibly good memories, though. If you well, asked me to name a shop, um, you know, on a square I'd lived on for about 20 years, I probably couldn't do it. <laughs> I could name a shop in Milan in the central square pit. Oh, yeah, because well, they, they recently got their first Starbucks. And it was some controversy because oh, wow. obviously Milan, the home of coffee, yeah. good coffee. Yeah. yeah. And there was a Starbucks there. It was a very nice Starbucks too. So oh, that prompted wow. a bit of local discussion. Or according to these people, there was a Bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, all of our brains are smaller than they would have been 3,000 years ago if we'd been born then. We've okay. lost about four ping pong balls worth of brain. Whoa, that's a lot. It is quite a lot. And it's not exactly clear what caused it because we invented agriculture 10,000 years ago as a species it's not that like writing dates back several thousand years so and it might be something to do with that it might be that I keep part of my brain in all of your brains Ooh. <laughs> I wonder what that was <laughs> no but like if you have lots of division of labour and you have a complicated system, you sort of divide up the cognitive tasks and you need a bit less brain space. Yeah. I think there is a theory that domestication makes your brain smaller because it works with animals for sure. So am I domesticated? Well, I think humans are domesticated, aren't we? Well, no, we're the domesticators. But well, who's domesticated us, aside from cats, according yeah, to some interpretation? domesticated us? The man. The man. <laughs> <laughs> Society has domesticated us. To be fair, I don't think I would thrive in the wild. I don't think you would either. I think I concur. <laughs> Dan, anything to do you I, contradict that statement? No, I, I... I think, well, I'm going off getting some berries and Anna's going off killing a yeah. wild cat and oh. you're trying to think of some cop dramas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which of us is going to be the most useful in the group. In the future, we will need cop dramas to survive. <laughs> right? We'll need... That hope that comes from knowing, like, will you find the bomb? Yeah. <laughs> okay, brain fart. Yeah. Like a, when you have a moment and you can't remember something, right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like um, this, this podcast has been a 10 year long one, for instance. Sure. Mm. Yeah. What about a brain squirt? Mm. What is that? <laughs> brain squirt. Quiz time. <laughs> it's where you try and think of one thing and it just shoves out tons of different yeah. things. It's like someone says, what's the capital of Malawi? And all you can think of is every other capital in Africa. Mm, oh, that's good. good. Mm. Yes, no, I was saying, yeah, that's probably closer than to mine, which you would be saying things that sounded right as a ramble. So like a quiz question like mm. that, but you genuinely went, it's it's Michael, no, Sarah, jo uh, jo oh, Joey, Chandler, um, like awesome. mums do when they're trying to remember your name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. They always run through, don't yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah. John, Katie, Claire, Hannah, <laughs> James, James, come over here. <laughs> um, it's just a feeble or abortive attempt at reasoning, but it dates back to the 1650s. Isn't that cool? Really? Oh, I'm so having a brain, brain squirt. squirt. But yeah. it was also, in, uh, this dates back to Old English, your brain locker. What is what? that? Say it again. Brain locker. Brain locker. It's someone who looks at a brain in South Africa. 
Brain. It's my brain locker. <laughs> brain locker. It's uh, it's just your head. Is that what I was gonna say? Is it your skull? Oh, okay, cool. Right. My brain locker. My brain nice. locker. Crazy that we had a word for that. Here's a, uh, one little hack. I was reading a lot of neuroscientists saying how you can hack your brain to make sure that. So if you're someone who forgets things a lot, or you have something important that you need to remember, and you just don't, you can't find it, write it down or anything. Take something, take an object, and just place it somewhere it shouldn't be. So if you're leaving the house, for example, and you're like, oh, why is this, you know, flute uh, flute here? Yeah, it'll make you go, ah, yes, I've been meaning to do that thing. It's a way of, of associating with a physical yeah. object. So that's just a great hack. I, I feel I like, you know, I do that with my hairbands. I put one hairband on the other wrist if I need to remember something. Oh, I good. put the second one on the other wrist if I need to remember a second thing. Ah. And then I put one back on the first wrist if I need to remember a third thing. <laughs> oh, <that's sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey, everyone. We're here to let you know that this week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Aura Frames. Aura. Wow. Oh. This advert really has an aura around it because <laughs> Aura Frames are absolutely amazing. Like, I don't know about you, Dan, but on my phone, I have well over a thousand photos, mm. most of which I never look at. What's the point of them being on my phone? I want them framed. I want them on my wall. Yeah. But I just don't have enough wall space. So what can I do? Well, this is what you can do, James. You can get a single device that sits inside your house that looks like it's a picture frame and a photo will be in it. But like a sort of Harry Potter wizard magazine, it will change photos <laughs> into a new photo every few seconds, depending on the speeds that you want to change it to. It's incredible. You can have your whole year just played in front of you as you're standing in the kitchen or in the bedroom. Or uh, if like me, I love having one in the bathroom. In the bathroom, <laughs> just a, an aura frame in the bathroom, so you can look at other bathrooms that you've stayed in over the years. That's perhaps. what I do exactly. <laughs> I have a thousand photos of bathrooms that I now have projected in my bathroom. And you too can get an aura because from now until Black Friday and Cyber Monday, Aura are having their best deal of the year. Listeners can save forty dollars on their best-selling Carver mat frame by visiting Aura Frames. That's a u r a f r a m e s dot com forward slash fish. When you do that, use the promo code fish and get forty dollars off their best-selling frames. That's right. So head to AuraFrames.com slash fish. Use the promo code fish and you're going to get $40 off their best selling frames. And you should do it now because Black Friday and Cyber Monday are here. And that is when the deal is for. So head there now. Do that. And terms and conditions apply. But also, we are sponsored this week by LinkedIn. That's right. LinkedIn. Have you started a business of sending out purely photos of bathrooms that you want to get out to people with a big <laughs> weird fetish for having them put it in displays in their bathrooms? Well, LinkedIn is the place to find someone like me. Uh, this is obviously, you all know LinkedIn. Such a wonderful place if you're working in the business world. It really connects people up. It allows you to find the right people to come and work for your business. And it takes out all the admin of having to put adverts out on the internet, meet people in person. They can tailor descriptions. They can tailor questions for the people you're looking to hire and find you the best candidate for your company. That's right. LinkedIn Jobs, they have simple tools. They have the purple hashtag hiring frame so people know that you're hiring. And right now, if you want to find the right qualified candidates for you, then post your job for free at linkedin.com slash fish. That's right. Head to linkedin.com slash fish. You're going to be able to post your job for free. Terms and conditions also apply. Um, but this is honestly the place that small businesses rate as the number one for delivering and quality hires versus all the leading competitors. So if you need someone, get there now. Okay, on with the show. On with the podcast. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that at the 1984 US Grand Prix, it was thought that Ayrton Senna crashed into a wall on the 47th lap. But it turns out it was actually the wall that crashed into him. Mm. This is another case for Jenga cop, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> this is an amazing story. So Senna is one of the greatest Formula One drivers ever. His career was cut short because sadly, 10 years later, he did have a crash in a Grand Prix, which uh, he died. Um, so it basically, he was, uh, he was in this Grand Prix and he's heading on cutting a corner 
very tight to the wall as he had done on previous laps. He nicks it. So afterwards, they're talking about it and he says, there's no way I hit that wall. I'm a precision driver and he was very cocky Senna. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a precision driver. That wall came into me. So they went out just because I guess, you know, they thought, well, maybe he's right. Let's check it out. Yeah. And they noticed that the wall had moved. And the reason was is because a car... It was a human dressed as a wall, wasn't it? <laughs> Who was hiding from the Jenga cops. But it was also saying anti-Catholic propaganda at the time, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, call back to last episode, everyone. <laughs> um, so basically, these walls were giant concrete blocks. And on a previous lap, a car had also hit this wall. And what they'd noticed was that it hit it with such force that it had knocked the back of it. And so the front bit jutted out a tiny bit, but right. only by 10 millimeters. One is what wow. they're saying. And, you're, and we're saying that, that was, he was so precise. He was so precise that that was enough. He, was he knew exactly where he wow. needed to take it. And so he nicked the wall. And this is how he is sort of known. He's That's known incredible. as this guy who, fact. yeah. He was the best. Do you, it, I believe so. Right. I mean, there's countless arguments in Formula One fans, but for me, he was the best. Mm. There you go. You heard it here first. So tragically, because he was cut off in his prime, we yeah. don't know where he would have taken it to. He won three world championships. He's been, you know, surpassed by Schumacher and others. Mm. But that's because of the longevity of a career. So, yeah, yeah, hard to know where he would have gone. I didn't know why it's got, why it's got Formula One. Oh, yeah. And it's oh, yeah. just the whole it's the whole point of Formula One <laughs> is that there is a formula and it's this set of rules that you have to adhere to yeah. and they change the rules every I don't know every year or every couple of years and you know and then everyone has to build entirely new cars and it's a nightmare mm -hmm. and that is the formula that everyone's complying with and the rules about the weight and the aerodynamics and the blah blah blah, right. blah, blah, blah. and I used to know well I do know someone a friend of mine used to work on Formula One um, doing the kind of modelling the computer modelling oh, wow. of the aerodynamics of the cars Great. basically you just do that hundreds of thousands of times modeling the airflow over a car to work out what's going to be best mm. and, then, and then they change the rules and then you have to like adjust Tweak everything it. in a fraction of a millimeter and all of this it's amazing and yeah. try and it's push amazing it sport. slightly further than everyone else is pushing it so yeah and because like there must be one perfect car theoretically oh right that would be the have the perfect aerodynamics for these rules i don't know I and mean, they, they all cross the line at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's when you have to bring in some variables like Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the red shells, the bananas. Red yeah. road, yeah. <laughs> A bubble that you drive into. Oh, it goes yeah. blob, blob, blob. <laughs> it slows you down. I mean, it, it would all liven up. What is Sometimes quite a dry sport to watch it is yeah. very uh, this is i think true of quite a lot of sports which is if you're not really into them and you watch them they seem quite boring on the outside and then as yeah. soon as you start reading about them it's like oh my god this is incredible yeah, yeah that's yeah. definitely true of f1 isn't it yeah. otherwise it is just people going round and round a, a thing but yeah you can't make the cars too good and obviously there are rules to stop you doing that partly for safety because if you go too fast it's very bad and safety has massively cracked down the last sort of 30 years but there have been great cars made in the past that they've had to change the rules to stop happening again like the six wheeled car oh, yeah, the no. six -wheeled. yeah it's so yeah. cool it's amazing that it's... was it designed by homer simpson <laughs> <laughs> yes it was uh, no this was in the 1970s and it was tyrrell one of the teams raced a six wheeled car realized that there would be an advantage to it because if you have four smaller wheels at the front rather than two big wheels then i think you increase the amount of contact with the ground so you've got more grip on the road that is you get more, more traction on the corners honestly that is like they've got someone in from the outside <laughs> who's never worked in formula one before and said look at this how can we improve this car yeah, yeah. and they've gone <laughs> More wheels. More wheels on it. <laughs> Imagine being in that meeting though, where like they were looking through it. They're like, we've looked through the manual thirty times now. There's nothing which yeah, says yeah. the maximum yeah. number of wheels is four. Yeah. We can do it. Yeah. There must be something there in the rules, Andy. There must be every other car ever. <laughs> no, it's not. They didn't think of putting it in the rules. It's like saying you can't have a crocodile driving. They didn't think of that. <laughs> there yeah. is no rule about the number of wheels, oh. but largely because they did this, and at the time there were very slight problems with it because they hadn't perfected the technology yet, because they'd only just. In invented the six-wheel car. They did get a few podium finishes, I think, for that car. But the FIA banned it in the end because they worried that we'd just get to a place where people were putting more and more wheels on cars. Oh. You just have a hundred wheels on a car. Yeah. That so that silly. <laughs> I think they did win. They won one Grand Prix with it, the Swedish Grand Prix. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. What a vindication that must have been. Oh, what a moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Are the cars longer? Because that's an advantage as well, right? For tight finishes. If your car is suddenly <laughs> 10 metres long. Well, I, I can think of one problem is like when you go into the pit stop to change your tyres, if you have to change 200 oh, tyres, yeah. it's going to take ages. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Oh, those are, I love the pit stops. Yeah. I do. Those are because those, that's a yeah. variation in a race, isn't it? And they used to have a lollipop man. Yeah. It's so sweet. Right? Really? It's yeah. really sad that they don't anymore, it's I think. Well, because they always build the days. tracks next to primary schools. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> but I do wonder like, you've just got a little old lady in a smock so, she's <laughs> chatting to some of the mums and all the drivers are going can I cross can I cross this pit stop has now lasted 18 minutes <laughs> So their job basically was to know when everyone had finished their yeah. jobs and then they lift up the lollipop and they could drive off. But now everyone just has a button. When you've done your job, you finish your things and yeah. then the lights change. It's rubbish. And that's, oh, that must be stressful as well. Because I can I can readily imagine fitting the wheel in 0.4 seconds and then forgetting to press my button. For yeah. Like, yeah. Well, if you had your hair band on your left wrist, <laughs> you might remember. <laughs> Here's a crazy pit stop thing that you're not allowed to do anymore, yeah. which is, and do, do you guys remember ages ago, Lewis Hamilton, there was a bit of controversy about one of the races where you have your team. So he's, he's who, what's his team again? He's with um, Mercedes. Mercedes. So he'd be, on, he'd be on the track with another Mercedes rider, part of the same team. It made more sense for Lewis to win. So there was this big controversy oh, yeah. that the guy in the lead slowed down and let Lewis <laughs> take the win for the points for the team, basically. It is fine, but it's seen as it's not, sport basically it's, it's they should be trying yeah but they yeah. do the same in cycling don't they i thought they haven't all the in time cycling in it's basically the the whole spot yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think in formula one it's obviously taboo because it was a big controversy at the yeah. time Is when it? Lewis did it, it. yeah <clears throat> but so what you used to be able to do in a pit stop is let's say you have <laughs> damaged your car yeah you could come in and they've called over the number two because you're the lead driver and they would just give you his car. Wicked. So That's he would really be out of the race. Yeah. So would your number two driver, you would want them to be pretty much exactly the same as you, right? If you're six foot three with yeah. very spindly arms, yeah, you yeah. need another six foot three with spindly arms. Well, so you don't have to fat yeah. around and start adjusting the seat yeah, exactly. and then like, changing the air con. <laughs> oh, radio one. Off, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the thing, isn't it? Because they all get weighed after the race. You, the driver and the car are weighed because if you're too light, it might be dangerous. And um, and drivers lose about three kilos during a race of wa of hydration, of water weight. Yeah, because they're so sweaty, right? It's yeah. so sweaty. It's Apparently it gets so hot in there as well. Like, that's what's, you know, it's sweaty, it's hot, it's boiling. And Damon Hill, there's a story. I couldn't find a good source for it, but it's claimed in a bunch mm -hmm. of places that he brings in, for some reason, a thermos of cold black tea. And the heat of the car yeah. makes it a nice piping hot Come tea for to drink. Oh, I, I heard that. I did hear That's that. That's yeah. very funny. <laughs> the safety stuff is just nuts in the cars these days. It's so impressive. So mm. these days, every single driver has a monocoque. <laughs> which is, it was when they used to have two cocks. <laughs> there was so many deaths. They were tripping over a lot. Uh, it's getting in the way of the, the levers. No, it's um, it's a cocoon, basically. It surrounds the driver and it's sort of the core of the car. Oh. And it's like the, um, I want to say a very hard bag. Um, like it surrounds the driver and it keeps them safe even if, the cra even if they crash. So they get into a bag. <laughs> they didn't know. I've, I missold it dramatically. Right. It's just like the, the sort of central command pod of the car, which actually okay. encases the driver. If you can yep. imagine the meninges of the brain, <laughs> yes. yeah. it's almost like the meninges of the, of oh, the driver. That's exactly. Yeah. It's like the very toughest mother. If only they called imagine. it that, I would have known it straight away. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, you know, the helmets are amazing. They have to be subject the helmets have to be subjected to 800 degree heat for 45 seconds in case there's a fire. Or, they have to be or able hot to tea. Up. Or hot tea, David Hills. <laughs> <laughs> the boss has really taken a pattering. Every time you blink, you lose 20 metres of road if you're going in wow. a fast Formula One car. So you have to be careful wow. when you blink. Yeah. And they've, they've measured it, and like drivers always blink at the same part of the course. It's really interesting. Oh, really? Yeah. I read that one thing that um, if you play the sounds of the cars on a Formula One track to a Formula One driver, they'll be able to tell which track it is just from the sounds that the cars make. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. Um, you need a special driver's license? Oh, really? Perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, you need a super license. That's what it's called. Really? Yeah. Really? Which Is that right? In, so does that yeah. mean if What's I took mean? part in the the Las Vegas Grand Prix starts this weekend? <laughs> yeah. If I flew over to Las Vegas and took part in it, I'd get points for not having the right license. I think you probably would get points. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Wow. 
do it anyway. I'll try it. <laughs> Shall I try it? In your electric car as well. Yeah. <laughs> they accelerate like they, accelerate they do well. accelerate well, but I'm not no. sure I could get around all the laps without recharging. <laughs> <laughs> He's now had a lovely coffee at the supercharger. I wonder if psycho you know psychopaths is that idea that they don't blink. I wonder if that would Sorry? make you a better. There's one way apparently of spotting a psychopath, according mm. to mm. people who look into it, is they blink much less than a regular and that's person. Why, that's oh, why yeah, they're forced to kill that. and kill again because they're so annoyed about their dry eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if you yeah. blink less, are you a better driver? Are they all psychopaths? Is yeah. what you're saying? All these F1 drivers. Well, yeah. Senna, Senna, just back to him very quickly, mm. sounded a bit sort of mm. like he was in an uh, odd mental place a lot of the time. <laughs> okay. um, well, as in, like, um, he never, whenever he arrived, his friend said, he never said hi. Like if he was coming to a race, he was just in a zone. He was just always kind of like Andy. That just really. sounds like rude. <laughs> so, I say hi. God, I said hi to you this morning, and it was an effort, frankly, but I did it. I think that's um, really normal. Like I would say, if you're racing, I can imagine not saying hello to anyone. Like you've got to be so in the zone. Yeah. What, so how many people are you having to say hi to? Because if it's just one or two people who are welcoming you, you're like, oh yeah, great, you have a nice chat. But if it's like all the fifty members of the team are saying hello, and like the big mascot in the silly suit. <laughs> Yeah. This is according to someone who works for the catering operation, uh, Lindy Redding. She said right. she said he would never say hi if he was in the zone, but when he did say hello, it was very genuine. He used to kiss us and hold our faces, which was hugely intense, but absolutely lovely. <laughs> you know what? Let's do the not hello next time. <laughs> Grief. That's the greeting equivalent of doing the washing up so badly that they never ask you. Who is. <laughs> yes. He never says hi. Don't say hi. Uh, uh, speaking of motor racing drivers, have you guys heard of Hella Nice? Hella uh, Nice. Hella Nice. That's it's a Hella Nice. Hella Nice. Hella Nice. Hella Nice. Yeah. It was a person from the 1920s. Real name Mariette Hélène Delong. She was an exotic dancer who danced at the Ritz in Paris, uh, and then she had a skiing accident and couldn't dance anymore and so became a racing driver. And she raced in five major Grand Prix in France and she was in an accident. This is why I was reading about her because we were talking about safety. She was in an accident where she was in an Alfa Romeo and she somersaulted through the air and she wasn't wearing a seatbelt because she didn't have to in those days. Oh her car went into the crowd, killed four people, oh uh, but she survived because she landed on a soldier who absorbed the full impact of her body. No! Saving her life. Oh, oh God. God. Did he die? <laughs> no, he didn't die. What? Good grief. Sorry, did she fly through the air or did her car, did she her in her car, car did. at the time? Her car went one direction, right. killed some people. Oh she went goodness. in the other direction and luckily landed on this very pliant soldier. Wow. <laughs> and they later married. I don't think they did, no. That's Good amazing. Grief. It's, it's incredible what you can survive. I mean, now they really survive extraordinary crashes because of the safety. Right. But yeah. even when you look back in the day, I mean, in 1993, have you seen the quite a famous crash? Two teammates, actually, who were called Fittipaldi and Martini. They were quite near the back. Okay. But one of their cars was like just behind the other. And I think the left wheel, front wheel of one car nicked the back right wheel of another car. Yeah. And it sent the front one into a full in the air backflip. Oh, yes. Yeah. Just does a backflip, oh. happily lands, skates over the finish line. Good grief. It's absolutely <laughs> wow, stunning. Wow, yeah. That's showboating. It really it is, Didn't yeah. they go with the headline, Martini, shaken, not stirred? <laughs> <laughs> they should have done. Here's a little quiz moment for you all. Okay. okay. Who hmm. is the guy who I think has done more Formula One races than anyone else? I'm 90% sure he's done more Formula One races than anyone else on the planet. More Grand Prix. Grand Prix. Oh, okay. okay, so, okay. so someone we for. must know of. No. Is okay. it the Michelin Man? It's not the Michelin Man. <laughs> Anna, I feel like you might have the answer. I've just I've got my hand up, I'm bursting. No, are you talking about the safety guy? The guy who drives the safety car. Uh, yeah, has been so doing cool. it for nearly twenty five years. Yeah. He's done more than four hundred and fifty Grand Prix. I can't believe it's the same guy. I just couldn't believe it's just one the bloke Isn't doing weird? every single Grand Prix. So what does he do, sorry? When there's an incident on the track, yeah. uh, there's an accident or like there's a horse runs out of the track, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> School day finishes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Receptions run out, lady yeah. pop ladies already, yeah. 
the the safety car drives out onto the track and kind of regulates the service. Everyone, everyone has slowly. to drive. Yeah, he drives behind around him. at twenty miles an hour, and everyone has to just slowly go behind him. And you're not allowed to overtake. Yes, anyone. of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know that feeling when you're driving and someone's kind of coming up your ass. Imagine that like times a million. <laughs> right. This is what that guy's going through every single day. <laughs> Someone coming up his ass times a million. Yeah. That is a tough <laughs> job. <laughs> <laughs> How was work today, darling? Well, I had 20 men coming up my house. <laughs> Want to sit down? No, it's all right. Actually. It's all right. After 25 years, though, you kind of you harden to it. Oh, <laughs> um, okay, does that count? A, as... He's a professional racing driver. He's called Bert Mailender, and he's is he? um... Bert Mailender. <laughs> <laughs> that's great though that's really cool I mean I guess he's not had any accidents himself over all that time so no. he does say it's quite stressful and he says the mo yeah. can you guess the most stressful person to have behind you what, as in which racing driver is, yeah, is which racing most because I, I, he said they're quite aggressive sometimes Shoei, it gonna... must be Schumacher it's actually Lewis Hamilton yeah. he says uh, really. Lewis Hamilton's really up in your face or up your bum like zigzagging <laughs> everywhere like really pushing going up up towards you but what's and I think the it's point you what? have to stay behind no, them you keep your tyres warm Keeping by zigzagging yeah. get out That's, yeah, yeah. I think it's the most precise sport in the world yeah. you guys have just written a book about sports What's oh, it have we? Again? Yeah, it's called um, <laughs> the Big Book of Sports. Isn't it? Yeah. No, it's... Everything to play Everything for. To the QI Book yeah. of Sports. Yeah, but surely this is the most. This is where the most thought has gone into the most tiny differences of like. <sighs> yeah, it is amazing. Must be like technologically that. for sure. I would right. say. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Like even there in the formula, there are even limits on the amount of data you're allowed to use to simulate the car aerodynamics. You're limited to 25 teraflops of computing power mm. when you're running the computer simulations of mm. air flowing over mm. a car you haven't even built yet. And then after all that stuff, like literally last night in the warm-up for the Las Vegas Grand Prix, someone hadn't nailed down one of the manhole covers properly. <laughs> <gasps> Just smashed into the car. Oh my God, I heard like, about that. They, they get, get sucked, sucked up. up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why do they keep building manhole covers on the F1 tracks? <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's... It's in the actual streets of Las right. Vegas. Uh, right. And they have to nail down every single manhole cover. I think the... they might not even use nails. They might use, like, concrete or something. God, you Whoa. don't want to be sort of a sewerage worker who pops up at the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck! <laughs> An escaped convict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, isn't it? <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. My fact is... There is such a thing as a ghost pond. Oh, <laughs> splash! <laughs> yeah, um, this is a. a so we're all familiar with ponds. Maybe just give us a. <laughs> just for the people not from the UK. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, no, actually, Dan, because you know what is a pond and what is a lake. Mm. So yeah. it's a very large mm. hill with just matter on it. Oh, no, it's the opposite of that. It's a small <laughs> indentation with water in it. That's right. Yeah. You look Sorry, so I always confused. get those mixed up. <laughs> oh, you got me there. You have me going. Um, <laughs> but basically, there are these things all over, particularly the UK, but I'm sure in other countries too. Mm. Uh, in fact, all over Europe, they do, they, they do know that. And they like all the farms in England used to have ponds, like fields would have a pond here or there in them, and they would either provide water for cattle or they would, you know, they're just useful things to have. But then over the years, they got abandoned and lots of them dried up. Or maybe they got choked by fallen leaves, you know, and all these ponds are now missing from the UK. There used to be twice as many ponds as there are uh, today in the 1970s. We had double the ponds. Yeah, I know. Like, why is no one marching? Why is no one super gluing themselves to Heathrow Airport <laughs> to bring the ponds back? Well, I think it's important that you know, like ponds are great because so many animal, like, animals and plants just they Sorry. what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they make that noise. They go, <laughs> <laughs> so many animals. You think we're still in the Formula One? Yeah, <laughs> that was Dubai. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right. Uh, I've got a pond. Have you got have a pond? You? Anyone I else got a pond? A pond. No. I, I want to. It's on my list of things I'd love to do is to dig a pond. Very easy. Just dig a pond, <laughs> yeah. pop some lining in it. Yeah. Sorry, can you just tell us what these ghost ponds are there? Well, okay, so ghost ponds. No basically. one wants to hear about my pond. Does <laughs> <laughs> no. tell us anything. We must come back to James's pond in a minute. But no, basically, they're huge biodiversity hotspots. You know, you get you get plants and species and dragonflies and beetles and all sorts of stuff <clears> where before you just have a field. And, you know, they're really important for that. And basically... 
the mud remembers. It's really weird. Yeah. So all of these ancient seeds might be left in the indentation that used to be a pond, and they can survive for over a century. And all you have to do, if you have that little dip in the ground, you refill it, uh, expose it to sunlight, and these old species just spring up and they come back with a vengeance. That's cool. And it's, so cool. it's kind of staggering. So there's a team at UCL, the Pond Restoration Research Group, led by Carl Sayer, and they've been going around Norfolk restoring these ghost ponds. Yeah. And suddenly, bang, life, biodiversity, really important stuff, which is really under threat at the moment. They reckon there's mm. 600,000 that are hidden still waiting to be restored yeah. in the UK, in the UK, in the UK alone. alone. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And it's, lo- it's longer than that, isn't it, for seeds? I'm sure we've mentioned, and I can't remember the exact number, but like the oldest seed ever found that can still be you know, watered and sunlit and grow is many thousands of yeah. years old. Yeah. And wow. so, yeah, these can be many hundreds. And what I really like is that you can sort of see a ghostly evidence of them, can't you? Like from above you can see it as like a, a slightly damp depression or it's yeah. a bit where crops don't right. grow as well because it's always been a bit too wet, the soil's never dried out. And I think often farmers, when they're expanding their land, rather than drain them, because that's a hassle draining a pond, they just dump a load of earth in them, wouldn't they? Or a load of plant matter, which doesn't stop them being wet. So they are, they have left their little pond prints. So that's cool. cool. But also I think ponds, they kind of have like a life duration don't they? Okay. It's like if you have a pond, like a pond farm, if you dig out a pond, right, because yeah. you're a farmer, if you just leave it, after about 100 years, it'll just cease to be. Oh, really? really? Okay. Yeah, they just kind of, they, they slowly silt up and silt up and silt up and then they <sighs> die. And it could be just like one really heavy rainstorm. Mm. A load of silt comes down. They're not a pond anymore. They're wow. just like these ephemeral things that kind of come and go. So they have to be kind of maintained, don't they? A little bit. They do. Or you clear out the leaves and, you know, if they've got trees over them, that's a nightmare for a pond, apparently. Sure so. is. Can I tell you about the leaves that have fallen into my pond? Oh, yes. Yeah. How big <laughs> is your pond? Like uh, the table that we're recording Okay, on. the one that no one can see. <laughs> yeah, it's about <laughs> half the size of that. Ooh. Nice. Okay, okay. James would describe something the size of a basin. Um, it's small. It's a small pond, but, but you know, but it's you've just got for, a pond. That's brilliant. It's just for animals to come and drink stuff. And you're not going to get a deer, nice. are you? you or might. a lion kneeling. I down. don't think. I don't think there will be wildebeest of lion <laughs> no. sipping at my pond in North London. You're not that far from the zoo. That's true. <laughs> you know, a catastrophic breakout, and suddenly James <laughs> looks out just a watering house. hole. <laughs> Humans make ponds. What else makes ponds? Um, I, I, uh, aliens. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> yes. On. yes, the equivalent of crop circles, pond circles. Oh, are, lovely. Yeah, no, not uh, non, non-human animals. Non-human animals. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I reckon, like, if you're a, a hippo and you sit down in some mud, yep. then yeah. it might create a pond. Mm. Yeah. Good point. Uh, whether or not that would be intentional, I guess, would be debated. Oh, I'm, saying I'm saying deliberate pond Whoa. makers. Okay. Oh, beavers, maybe? I guess they're damming things up. It's a, it's not really a pond. It's not quite, no. It's a pond. So, Andy, if you want to get a pond in your backyard, you but you can't be bothered digging, buy yourself a goliath frog. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, so goliath frogs do this. It's okay. a really interesting thing where they, they move rocks, giant rocks, basically their own weight, and they get it so that they cut off water and they build their own pond so that the eggs are more safe in there. They can keep attention to them, make sure the tadpoles and so on are, are all they're in they're place. They're the biggest they frogs, aren't they? The they are. Frog. If, for the people at home who can't see it, there's a glass of water in front of Dan. <laughs> they're probably about two or three times bigger wow. than that. Yeah, they're that massive. Really big. And they think one of the, you know, there's always theories, but one of the theories is that their size is to do with mating, to do with the best rock movers and, you know, oh. that's partially why they may be that big, specifically because they build ponds. Do you know what else makes ponds? Um, oh, so this is a subset of humans. Oh, okay. I was about to say okay. elephants. So, um, <laughs> schoolgirls. S- subset. subset oh. of humans. Uh, that wasn't what I was thinking of. Does you... that count as a subset, though? That's a subset of it humans. Is a subset, yeah. yeah. Why? Right. Did you? Well, make are you a... questioning whether or not they're humans? <laughs> or... <laughs> I wasn't sure what subset meant. I thought it meant it had to be like people from you know the southern hemisphere, or like I thought it was bigger yes, than just saying underneath. you know <laughs> Slipknot <laughs> fans. You know. Yeah, <laughs> just a group of humans. Something. Group of humans Why did who you make say puns. Girls? You, you used to be a schoolgirl. I was trying to think of uh, what a subset of humans would oh, be. Oh, okay. I was just wondering if when you were a schoolgirl, you dug ponds and that you had inside knowledge um, that I wouldn't have had. No, we got taken to ponds. So we got told about newts. Um... <laughs> okay, so not schoolgirls. Okay. Not schoolgirls. Um, no. A okay. subset of humans who make, make ponds. Is it a profession? <clears throat> no, it's more of a ideology. Zen gardeners. Oh, Ooh, okay. That and that is true, undoubtedly, but yep. not who I was thinking of. Communists. Oh, the opposite. <laughs> oh, fascists. <laughs> Nazis. Whoa, yes, you got Nazis. it. Nazis. Um, so there's quite a lot of bomb craters around Europe, 
And if you drop a bomb, it makes a big indentation, and that indentation can then collect water and become a pond. Ah. Yeah. Wow, that's, so that feels like a silver lining. It is, really, and to, possibly to a reason to start more wars. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, no um, wow. just, I mean, well, just the Nazis were pond-making, right? The Allies were pond-making oh, as well. We were all pond-making. Yes. A lot of ponds in Dresden. Right, probably. right, right, right. Um, wow. But wow. yeah, a lot of ponds made by both sides. Um, and the thing is that they've done some studies on it, and they did this um, in Hungary in particular, and they found that um, they found 274 species in ponds made by bombs. Uh, and they included, like, for instance, um, an algae, which is, had previously only been found in Chilean salt lakes. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and a furry shrimp that had only been recorded twice in the last 25 years in Hungary. And they were in these ponds That's made by amazing. bombs. Cool. I mean, this is what they find with these ghost ponds when they rejuvenate them. You get species that you haven't seen for many, many years. And it's such a mystery, I think, <clears throat> how stuff turns up, how nature knows. And particularly, I think, in slightly bigger ponds than um, maybe James's garden pond. But you'll find... No offence. Um... I can't even imagine a pond bigger than James's garden pond. <laughs> Please don't write in for me taking the piss out of James having a small pond, okay? You get... <laughs> okay, here we are. New name for this podcast. Don't write in. <laughs> uh, I was the eels. Would be my next <laughs> James Harkins podcast, do you reckon? Yeah. <laughs> What's, come on, give us the... You will need a bit more detail, but I'm, I'm interested. Okay, first episode. Guess what leaves have fallen in my <laughs> pond? Are you having a guest to your pond each week? Yeah, but they'll be an animal, so they can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> the first episode of Dragonfly, and they just go... <laughs> Monaco. <laughs> <laughs> we have to guess what animal is at your pond chat yeah. that week. That's yeah, great. It's That's almost really always a snail. <laughs> it's never the wildebeest, <laughs> guys. So I always, I always love eels in ponds, because how did they get there? Oh, yeah. And all we know is that eels can move across sort of, dry, not dry land, but across right. land that's moist because they can breathe through their skin, wow. not just gills. So gills require some pressure um, for the water to be forced in, but they can actually breathe through their skin. So they must just flop out of a river. But then how do they find their way so to someone's garden Everyone's pond? looking at me just to say no eels in my pond. Oh, oh that'll be a big, big episode. All in yeah. my hovercraft. Yeah. But is it, like, I think, is there not an idea that sometimes things get in ponds because they're dropped by birds and stuff? There's an oh, idea of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. there could be that. Can I tell you about one of the most interesting ponds in the world? Please. Please. This yes. is called Don Juan Pond in Antarctica. Uh -huh. And it's really weird. It's quite, it's very big. That's not the weird thing. It's full of water. That's not the weird thing either. Well, it's in Antarctica, so being full of water is unusual. Yeah. Exactly. That is the weird thing. And it's because what this water is like, it's really dense and really syrupy, and it's full of calcium chloride. It's kind of salt, right? Mm -hmm. And it, the water remains liquid even 50 degrees below freezing. Hmm. Even wow. 50 Celsius it's below incredible. zero. What 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 what's that all about? Well, it's because it's, it's because it's the most salty body of water in the world. Exactly, isn't it? and they don't know where the water comes from. There, I read an interview with a scientist who said we've been studying it for sixty years. We're wow. pretty sure it's fed from beneath, but we're not totally certain. And what yeah. does it's amazing? What does the cold feel like if it's gone beyond the point of where it freezes into a block? Oh, I imagine very cold. I bet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you need a wetsuit. <laughs> well, you mate, <laughs> let's say you're swimming in regular water. Yeah, 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 it yeah. freezes, right? So you can't dive into it. It's an ice block. You yes. can't get in there. I right? know you mean but you will have been outside in the air temperatures lower than zero <laughs> yeah but oh, oh, yeah. no i'm just curious what like water what a, just the feeling the sensation of it's the... really really cold i think it's yeah. just the only way anyone can i don't think that. anyone I, but no one must have ever jumped into this pond because they would have died there we go yeah. here's what's interesting about that thing is um you would be able to lie down in it and read a newspaper like in the dead sea because it's oh, so yeah. salty i oh. guess Oh, because you float, you float right on top of it. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't sink. Could you concentrate on what you were reading for how <laughs> fucking cold it is? <laughs> no, it depends on the paper, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> some tricky Guardian articles might be a yeah. bit of a stretch, like the long read you wouldn't get through. <laughs> some quick bites in the sun, you'd probably yeah. be fine. You know um, Vespasian, uh, the Roman mm. emperor, uh, he yeah. heard about the Dead Sea and he heard that people were just floating it, but he didn't believe it, and he didn't want to try it himself, so he just got prisoners thrown into it to see what would happen. <laughs> oh, wow. And they floated. They floated, yeah. Wow. I will say, in case you're just going to book a trip, um, that probably don't, A, right now, um, but B, in case you were going to book a trip to the Dead Sea to float, disappointing. Anna sank. <laughs> I, I was quite sinking. One star, sank. <laughs> You'd had a big lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Stop the Podcast. Stop the Podcast. Hey everyone, this week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Canva for Teams. Yes, Canva for Teams, that is a design platform that makes it very easy for anyone to create stunning content in any format. So if you want to make presentations, if you want to make documents, if you want to have a whiteboard where you can all throw around the best ideas, brainstorm and collaborate in your Canva for Teams, uh, you can do that. Or you can print stuff out. So I know Andy has used Canva to print out lots of stuff. If you go to his house, there's just Andy mugs everywhere, <laughs> Andy coasters, Andy Andy curtains, Andy seal, everything's Andy. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's it's wonderful. Don't let him be told any different. Um, yeah, it's honestly an amazing place. You can get all the things that James just said. On top of that, they give you premium fonts. They have photos, graphics, a library that you can use if you want to boost up the quality of all the presentations that you're doing. You can create engaging videos through them. It just makes the whole thing easier to make the aesthetic of what you're doing just premium quality. So. If you would like to get involved, try out Canva for Teams. All you need to do is head to canva.me slash fish. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash fish. And you'll get a free 45-day extended trial. That's right. So design today, collaborate today with Canva for Teams by going to canva.me slash fish and you can get your free 45-day extended trial there. On with the podcast. On with the show. Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1912, the woman with the most perfect feet in America was divorced because her husband was jealous of all the attention she was getting. Brilliant. It's relatable. Um, James, can I just say... <laughs> is that because you got such amazing feet, or because you want to divorce <laughs> your wife? <laughs> can I just say, James, this was an impossible... Fact to research. Yeah. When you go when you Google nice feet or perfect feet in America, <laughs> mm. oh my goodness. It there's a lot of stuff to get through first <laughs> before you find out about Yeah. yeah you so have tell to... us about this woman. Well, she just had really nice feet. <laughs> it was a stunt by the chiropodists of the USA <laughs> to find the perfect foot. And they eventually managed to find it on the end of a leg <laughs> of a woman called Miss Clara Smith Houston, who coincidentally was also a chiropodist. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Oh. So, Suspects. Feels a bit rigged to me, doesn't it? It does feel a bit rigged. I don't know. You might get into an industry because your feet are so nice. People have complimented you your whole life. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, um, this story made it into some newspapers, just as the chiropodist had hoped. Yeah. Um, but the husband of Miss Smith Houston was not impressed, and he sent her a telegram like really divorced by text um, saying <laughs> friend wife not a great start no. <laughs> congratulations on putting your best foot forward nice pun nothing like notoriety no matter how cheap Ooh. Ooh. send your picture to the pink journals and call on me for cash with which to advertise yourself further full stop your husband full stop and then Clara was later quoted in another newspaper saying that she decided if a man was so jealous, he would not even allow me to boast of a perfect foot, then I best give him up and all the luxuries with which he provided me. Wow. Except the one thing, happiness. Here, here. Here, here, Clara Houston. <laughs> no, I agree. I the luxuries. Can I just, so his, his message, when he's saying um, advertise yourself in a newspaper, is he saying, because you're single now? What's that second? I think What's that it's, I think it's just because it's, oh, you're now a foot person, are you? You know, you're now just sort of like trading on your feet. I think well, he was also mm. implying that she was living off his money. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, and he yeah. was like, well, if you want more money just to advertise yourself to the world for your awesome feet, okay. then yeah. fine. Got full it. stop. Your husband, full stop. Mm, those aggro full stops. So the question here is, what is the perfect foot? What did Clara have? And she had... Seven toes. <laughs> she had no seven toes. I guess <laughs> having seven toes. <laughs> so she she had uh, nine inches. They were nine inches long. Do you uh, know what size that is, though? Uh, I just know. I've just, I've just read it from this. So you've just, you've just written down nine inches, but you don't know how big or small that is, presumably well, no, no. for a woman's foot. Because no, actually, no, no, Dan goes into the shoe shop and he says, <laughs> I, I, I reject your size existence. I'm going to give it you an inches. You can work it out. 256 barley corns, my good man. <laughs> I'd like a shoe that's about the size of a glass, which I drank from the other day. I want a shoe that doesn't fit in James's con. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, for the listener, um, it's size 3.5, which is very small. And Probably what is the, foot. why does it say in 10 inches around the instep? The yeah. circumference, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Mm. So very, very small feet. Three point five. I yeah. mean, not freakishly small. No, but, but that is small. It's petite. it's exactly one seventh her height in accordance with the Greek rule of sculpture. Oh, that's so, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is from the the day book where this was all published, and yeah. it's an amazing blog, by the way, that you found, James. Yes. Mm. Second glance history. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant, uh, and it was mm. really nice because it was they had the cuttings of all the newspapers and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So really I didn't cool. have to go digging for them myself. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Uh, and then they found that there was a new perfect foot found in 1916, uh, which belonged to a nine-year-old girl called Mary Boca. Uh, this was found in Chicago, and uh, Mary's mum said, Mary had very pretty feet when she was a baby. I felt nature's gift must not be marred. I began massaging her feet with cold cream to make them strong and smooth and rubbed them carefully to preserve the natural outline. Gosh. Yeah. And so her mum realised when she was really young that she had really nice feet and then put special stockings on her so that she didn't damage the feet and all that kind of stuff. It's like the Williams sisters' dad, isn't it? Yes. They, I bet they made a Hollywood film about her in the 30s. I just don't, I don't get the whole feet thing. I know lots of people really like feet. 20% of men, I believe. Only 3% of women. 20% of straight men. I think do it was you, that. What do you mean, maybe it was 10%. What, what do you mean, really? I feel like I... Fetishise. Right, okay. So, oh, really? Because there, there, there's a website called WikiFeet. Oh yeah, mm. which features a great number of feet. Features greatly in your search history after this week. <laughs> it does now, I, oh dear. Are there only three rules on Wiki feet? Mm-hmm. Only five toes. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. The rules change constantly. Got Every year. updating their feet. So, um, no, so it's, it's you have to be. It's normally. Um, people posting pictures of women's feet. I don't think the men's section on WikiFeet is enormous. Um, it's sort of women over 17 who are listed on IMDb, so you have to be in the public eye somehow. Um, no copyright breaches and no adult content. But there are people who complain a lot. Um, they get aroused with each other on WikiFeet. They'll post on a photo NFS, which means no feet showing. Which is a <laughs> problem. <laughs> that is weird. But what? I think if it's if someone's wearing, like maybe if you've got a welly on. Uh, like, well, I, this is okay. pointless to me. I this think is... if you've got a welly on, you're on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> My friend has a page. It's a mutual friend. I won't say her name though, because it is a bit of a weird site. But um, mm. she has a page on there, and it has like ratings. So she has three out of five. Three. Yeah, which is uh, okay. You She's got get, okay yeah, feet. You wouldn't get in the Uber, would you? If out of three out of five. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit I mean obviously it's pretty odd stuff and it's I think you can if you say take my f- pictures off this website they do yeah okay nice. yeah is... they seem quite nice there was a journalist who writes for the well I, I read an article in the cut anyway so she writes for the cut among other things and she was going out with someone who said hey do you know you're on WikiFeed and he, she said no I don't and no, so saw that she had indeed been uploaded her feet had been uploaded because they get it off like public Instagram pages for instance so there were pictures of her on the beach on Instagram and someone's taken her feet and she I mean oh, she said wrong. okay I'll get in touch so she got in touch with the person um, and so she interviewed this guy who posted her feet and she was very fair I, I have to say and I thought he did seem a bit odd um, and she did say at one point, I've noticed that sometimes within 10 minutes of me posting an Instagram story that shows my feet, the screenshot is up on WikiFeet. How does that happen? And he said, look, I don't just sit there looking for it. If I happen to see it and I like it, I'll put it on there. But I'm not sitting there all day and staring. It's like, it sort of started off quite nice. And then he obviously, you know, he kept on saying what beautiful feet she had. I read an article um, that said that the incidence of foot fetishism increases as a response to epidemics of sexually transmitted diseases in history. Interesting. Uh, this was a guy called Dr. James Giannini uh, and his colleagues who did the study. And they looked back as far back as the 12th century and they found that when there was a spike in STIs, people preferred feet and it might have been that they were just less interested in penetrative sex because they might get oh so your 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 feet are a bit safer to fancy i guess so yeah because yeah what's what's the worst you can get athletes Athletes on your (laughs) cock (laughs) athletes cock yeah i think they went all the way up to the 80s and they found even in the aids epidemic that um when that happened then uh, the numbers of foot oriented and foot fetish pictures in kind of porn magazines and stuff shot up there because Blimey. yeah self-preservation i guess people wow. are thinking well where else can i go can i tell you about hogan fukunaga yeah he was arrested in the year 2000 oh, no. i know along with 11 acolytes 
That's a bad start, isn't it? <laughs> when you and your acolytes have been picked up. Um, so he was the head of a, a cult in Japan, which offered followers right. analysis of their spiritual and mental health entirely based on their toes. Right. So followers would pay 600 quid to have their feet stroked and then looked at by uh, Mr. Fukunaga. Consenting adults. Consenting adults. Uh, c- consenting adults with more money than mm. sense. Right. And no, um, consenting adults with maybe too much money on their hands and, and uh. who fell for the story that, oh, I can predict your future through your toes. And they it's were like always... a pedicure come fortune teller, right? Yeah, it's, not, it's like, cross, like cross my foot with silver. The predictions were all very suffering based. They, they predicted, oh, you'll die of a horrible disease or oh. you'll fall into debt. So that wasn't nice. Right. And, um, but you can avert your problem if you sign up for one of our lecture courses or if you buy a pinch of Buddha's ashes at a mere £120,000. Okay. They were running this cult for about 15 years. They made 500 million quid out of it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, And then he claimed later on that he had been simply obeying the voice of heaven but that he had since forgotten what the voice had said. (laughs) (laughs) Rip a load of people off, maybe? I think so. (laughs) It feels like in this cult being called the head of the operation is the wrong title. (laughs) (laughs) That should be the junior role. Yeah, you're absolutely right. (laughs) Yeah, he was the big wow. toe. When you have a, a, an enormous interest in feet, I believe it's called podophilia, mm. which yeah. means there is a word that should be coined for people who have an abnormal interest in podcasts. So when no, what, when no, I no. have Harkin's <laughs> podcast, you might yeah. have Andy's well, podophile no, cast. No, I'm Could not. You? I'm saying would, you, that... would all your acolytes be called podophiles? <laughs> <laughs> you could get badges made. <laughs> I'm a bonafide. <laughs> I shouted the mob outside my house. <laughs> oh, um, no, but there should be a word for people who like podcast lots. Because podophile is taken by the feet people. Let's right. call them feetophiles. Yes. <laughs> we'll take their word back. Um, but, you know, there should be something. Audio yeah. file. Audio like file, that's good. But it's quite confusing because <laughs> it's also an audio file. Yeah. Oh, it oh, is. That's, yeah. What, that's what makes it that's so perfect. perfect. Funny. Sorry, yeah. it's actually better than uh, a confusing... Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. So famous, famous uh, names who love a foot include <laughs> Elvis. Are we really doing this? Are we really doing? There's a lot of people who have admitted to loving feet and I having know, a bit of feet. It's quite... <laughs> It's just quite a turn for us, isn't it? Like celebrity toe suckers is what we're, <laughs> apparently this podcast is now about. It was a story, but apparently Elvis really loved it. What's interesting is there is obviously quite a lot of famous stories about, you know, his henchmen would go out into a crowd after a gig. A henchman. henchman and cut off people's feet. <laughs> <laughs> and they would bring them back to the volcano lair yeah. that Elvis had in Graceland. His foot soldiers, yeah. They would go oh, out uh, and good. they would, so they would, you know, go, you, you, do you want to come meet Elvis? And obviously it was, you know, to bring women backstage and apparently they screened their feet is, is what they is often crawling said. around on the floor <laughs> in the gig just looking for feet yeah exactly <laughs> just they, sorry I dropped an earring <laughs> presumably most women went to the gigs wearing shoes how um, are they doing that don't I, I you know it's just a rumour what just, it's just a rumour <laughs> we know that he loved feet and the, the story is is that that was part of what it you know, the screening is what would go okay. on. I don't know. Lucky. The story is. Can I, um, <laughs> can I steer us back towards Karma Waters with a sure. um, thing about corns? Um, you know, you mm. get corns on your feet. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Agony. Can, can you, can they transfer to your pain? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe so. Popcorn. Um, but they used to be, used to have street corn cutters, right? right. That was the thing. Oh and, God, really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, it was you know, it's sort of pretty. And it's it's obviously if you have corns, they're really painful. What you, would you do? Would it be like filing a nail? Oh, like there that are all kind sorts of, of procedures, right. basically. Oh. But the weird thing is, I just like this. I was on the blog Foot Talk, which is another great foot-based blog. Oh, yeah. I really recommend it. Um, but they used to be jingles. They would advertise themselves by singing jingles in the streets. And the weird thing about this is that sometimes celebrity composers would write jingles for corn cutters. Oh, really? That was, yeah, yeah. Like, so, how celebrity are we talking? Mozart's got his... Um, well, Irving Berlin. I'm going to say the name Orlando Gibbons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Orla- not Orlando. <laughs> Way. I mean, <laughs> so he... Wow. He was, he was famous at the time. He, you know, he was the organist at Westminster Abbey. Hmm. He was eventually named Virginalist to the King. <laughs> <laughs> that was a school he was called, that was it? <laughs> a virginal being a kind of piano, obviously. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, how did, do we know how the song went? The jingle I went? I, sadly, I don't think we do. We're, they're, uh-huh. they're pretty sure that he came up with jingles for corn cutters as right. well, as a kind of sideline. I don't know if it was lucrative or a fun wow. thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. You, got, you guys have just reminded me, my, uh, Wilf, my son, um, he uh, used to love corn on the cob, but he always used to call it corn on the cock. That was the phrase that he used. <laughs> um, can I tell you something about horses' feet? Yeah. yeah. Which I love, is yeah. that horses' feet are always giving you a middle finger. One oh. big middle finger. Every horse's hoof is what we call a horse's foot. Um, it's just a big middle finger. And this is because they once had five toes on their feet many, many millions of years ago. Um, they're actually kind of three of them still visible because you've got two little vestigial ones. If you know oh, horse's right. legs, they're kind of a bit out the leg. Um, but the hoof is just the middle finger. Wow. And there's actually a biologist called Catherine Cavana who recently was sorting through preserved horse embryos for reasons she didn't go into. And she saw that in the very, very early days of horse gestation, mm. they have five fingers on each foot. Wow. And then you see it in the cells and it's like they're about to grow and then they decide not oh, to grow so because weird. they've evolved out of it. So let me ask you this. If a horse with five toes rocks up to the Grand National, mm-hmm. are there regulations no to rules say? Against it. No rules no against rules. it. No rules and it's five times faster. Yeah, ridden by a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that the women of Chicago have been famous throughout America for abnormally sized feet. Uh, big or small? No. Big. Oh, okay. In the early 20th century. So this um, perfect foot, the second one, was in Chicago. And everyone was surprised because people in Chicago <laughs> usually have massive feet. <laughs> what a funny cliche. <laughs> it's so amazing. About. And I looked in the newspaper archives, yeah. and sure enough, if you look, like before, you know, the 20s, and search for big feet Chicago, there's all these articles are going, yeah, they all got big feet. And then you get people in Chicago saying, yeah, we do have big feet, but actually that also means we have big intellect. Wow. Yeah, sure it does. Is it so that is it just the women or is it the people? It's just the women of Chicago. Is it so that they can like walk out over the Great Lakes and distribute their weight better? Oh, that would be good. Yeah. 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 I thought maybe because it's the windy Mm. city, isn't it? And it would help you not to get blown over. Great shouts. Yeah. Yeah. All these uses. (laughs) That's that's evolution. (laughs) That is such funny. Is there any evidence behind it? Is it? Is it? Is it true? No, I can't be true. I mean, I'll be honest. I haven't gone to Chicago and measured all the women's (laughs) feet, Um, but it can't. Get Elvis's henchmen to go. <laughs> okay that's it that is all of our facts thank you so much for listening if you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast we can all be found on our social media accounts i'm on instagram on at schreiberland james uh my instagram is no such thing as james harkin andy mm-hmm. uh i'm on uh, twitter and now blue sky at andrew hunter m yeah. And if you want to get in contact with us as a group, Anna, where do they go? You can go to at no such thing on Twitter or you can email podcast at qi.com. That's right. Uh, you can also go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. If you'd like to check them out, there's also some merch uh, and lots of other fun things. Do check it out. But otherwise, just come back here. We'll be back again with another episode and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.